church fam, I am so excited to be wrapping up our series on the book of Proverbs. If you've missed any of our talks, you can go back and listen to those on Facebook or YouTube. We've been talking about wisdom and how we can live a foolproof life. And I love that we're wrapping up the series on Grad Sunday where our teens and young adults are right on the edge of going out into the world, you know, making their own way, their own decisions, raising families, building careers. And so what a better note to end this series on this Grad Sunday than to look at what the Bible says about living a foolproof life. Now, I, I can remember being in a similar place as many of our grade 12 students and applying to colleges and choosing what to study and where to study. And I had narrowed it down to Gordon College and Houghton College. Both these schools have my majors. They were similar in price, both Christian colleges. Uh, Houghton, however, was out in the country. Gordon College was located near downtown Boston. One was closer to home, one was further away. And I agonized over that decision for weeks. I, I just couldn't decide which school to go to. And it's funny because I look back on my upbringing and my church did a really good job teaching me about how to make decisions in the black and white areas of life. You know, things like don't tell lies, you shouldn't gossip, don't cheat on your test. But the church didn't really teach me how to navigate these types of decisions, you know, the gray areas of life, where to go to college when both options are good, what to study at college when there's so many good opportunities. And the older I get, the more I've realized that life is a lot more complex than just black and white decisions. Life is full of gray areas, areas like, should I date this person? Should I marry this person? Should I move to a new city? Should I go to college or stay at home for a gap year? How should I retire? When should I retire? And our culture today would suggest that the answer to these gray areas is just simply more knowledge and more facts, that we don't need God to help us make these decisions. And in some cases, this is true. You know, some decisions only require facts and knowledge. Like, should I go to the hospital if I break my leg? Probably. Should I tell my child to stop eating dirt? That's probably a good idea. But what about those decisions that are right decisions, but they're not necessarily wise decisions? See, knowledge can't tell you when, if ever, is the right time to have your parent move into a nursing home. Facts can't tell you whether that person you've been dating is, is the right person to marry. And knowledge and facts, I can't tell you how to resolve that, that never-ending family conflict that's been around for so long. See, at the end of the day, facts and knowledge are, are helpful tools. They tell us how things are, but they're not enough to tell us how things ought to be, which is why we need wisdom. Wisdom helps us navigate the gray areas of life. And so to attain wisdom, I think we first need to understand what wisdom is and what it isn't. And scripture is filled with commands to seek wisdom. We've, we've been talking for the past few weeks about this. So I want to zero in on what wisdom is and what wisdom isn't. Proverbs 9 verse 1 is where we're going to start out. It says this, wisdom has built her house. She's set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Now I want to pause there for a second. Wisdom is personified by this wise woman cooking an extravagant meal. And interestingly enough, a few verses down, Solomon personifies foolishness. And, and many of its qualities are the same as wisdom, but there's some noticeable differences. Check this out. It says this in verse 13. Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. Just like the, the wise woman, she sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. But this is where it gets different. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. Now, these two women do much of the same thing. They, they invite people into their homes 
Even simple people are invited. They prepare meals for their guests, but the contents of their meals are very different. The wise woman has taken time to carefully cook and prepare this meal. You know, meat and fresh wine. And the foolish woman invites her guests in, not for wine, but stolen water. And and not for meat, but secret food. In today's terms, it would be like me inviting you over for a sirloin steak, you know, with grilled shrimp on top and some Parmesan cheese and mashed potatoes and garlic green beans on the side and a a glass of Merlot, while a, a foolish person would invite you over for stolen water and hot pockets. And isn't it interesting that the time spent creating this extravagant meal versus the lack of preparation to take stolen water and secret food? I I think Solomon is trying to get at something here, something that feels especially relevant today, that foolishness is a lot like Hot Pockets. They might be tasty, they take just minutes to cook in your microwave, but a quick, easy, microwavable meal is no substitute for a home-cooked meal. Jim Gaffigan poetically puts it like this, nobody is ever proud of eating a Hot Pocket. Like, you never go to a fancy restaurant, have a waiter approach you and say, today's special is a sea bass with a side of kale and a Hot Pocket. Not to mention when when you do actually eat it, it's like ingesting boiling lava because it burns your mouth. You're tasting rubber for a month. And just living off of Hot Pockets alone isn't enough to sustain you. If you're feeling really stir-crazy in quarantine, go ahead and test this out. Eat a bunch of Hot Pockets and go on a 5K run and see if you can actually make it to your destination. We live in this Hot Pocket culture, this culture that sees what we want and we want it now. You know, we want instant fame on social media. We want to build our business in days. We want to see our kids successful the, the second they put pen to paper. We want that perfect marriage. We, we want that perfect retirement And so we look to knowledge and facts and and quick hacks to learn and get where we're headed sooner. Ian Cron describes it like this. We are all in a race to hurry up and matter. But you know, nothing great has ever been built overnight. Nothing that's long-lasting, at least. You can't have a perfect marriage overnight. It takes daily decisions and intentionality to grow. You can't have a, a perfect retirement overnight. It takes discipline and time. And I fear that we've come to believe this lie that the the more knowledge and information we have, the sooner we'll arrive at our destination, which would be true if life was black and white, like we said. But, But what happens when you reach a fork in the road where both options are good? If you try to push through the gray areas of life on knowledge and facts alone, it's a lot like running a 5K on a diet of hot pockets and stolen water. It's not enough to get you to your destination. Now, in contrast, the wise woman takes time to cook a meal, to create something that will bring life and rejuvenation to her guests. For mine and Hannah's eight-year anniversary this past month, Hannah surprised me by remaking our wedding cake for me. And this was a process because our wedding cake was the goat. And if you, if you don't know what that means, it means greatest of all time. It, it had cheesecake, ganache, chocolate layers, buttercream, frosting, And Hannah spent days, in fact, just to get the buttercream right, she took an hour to whip the buttercream by hand to get that perfect consistency. And and I know there's someone who's listening right now who's like, if only you had a kitchen aid, it would take five minutes. But Karen, we live on a pastoral salary, so we use spoons and spatulas. She spent time following the recipe, building the cake layer by layer, step by step. And I had that cake and it was incredible. I mean, blew my mind. I savored every bite of it. It tasted just like it did on the wedding day. Now, I imagine that if my wife had just read the ingredients and thrown it all together and popped it in the microwave for 10 minutes, that cake wouldn't have been the goat. But to build those layers, to make it, took a series of directions and a series of steps to get it just right. See, if we want to cultivate wisdom in our lives, if we want to be able to tackle the complexities and the gray areas of life, we have to grow in wisdom. And and wisdom, like building anything great, takes time. It's not something we can just pop in a microwave and and attain in five minutes. It's not something that a self-help book or a YouTube video can teach. Wisdom takes time to cultivate. 
It's a step-by-step process and a never-ending journey. Verse 6 says it like this. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. I heard Pastor Mike Todd use this word in context in a way I hadn't heard it before. He said, instead of walk, he uses the word stride. He said, because the word stride is defined as walking with long, decisive steps in a specific direction. So to cultivate wisdom in our lives, we must stride in wisdom. We must take daily intentional steps in the direction of wisdom. And this is where I want to challenge you because all of us, we're striding in some direction. For, for some, it's towards career advancement. For others, it's physical fitness or retirement or towards that relationship. We're all striding towards something, taking long, decisive steps day by day. The question is, what are you striding towards? Growing up, I was bullied in school by a group of guys, and I can remember running down the road with our track team one day, and I was in last place, and one of the bullies yelled out the window, it looks like you left a piece of trash, talking about me, behind. You better go pick it up. And this was normal life for me, and it happened day after day. It made me self-conscious. You know, I always was second, triple, quadruple guessing what I was wearing, um, what I would say, how I would present myself in public. And this is something I carried with me years later. So much so that when Hannah and I moved to Nashville to pursue music, there were elements of my pursuit of music that became pursuits of acceptance. And from the outside, it may have looked noble, you know, playing churches in different venues. There's a lot of great things that happen. It looked like we we're heading in the right direction. And I pushed daily towards the goal of success, towards the goal of achievement, so much so that we left our jobs, we toured the country for a year, and by the end, I was more anxious than I'd ever been in my life and just as unfulfilled. See, all of the knowledge, facts, and life hacks that the music industry taught me, they they could tell me how much money we were making or losing quarterly. It could tell me how to gain more followers and reach more people, but it wasn't enough to cure my need for acceptance. I was pursuing acceptance and achievement, and it was a lot like running on a diet of Hot Pockets. It could not sustain me, and it was never enough to get me to my intended destination. David, the king of Israel, once said this, I am constantly aware of your unfailing love, Awareness of this unending love is the beginning of wisdom. You see, when we begin to understand God's love for us, that it's not something that's earned or attained through more knowledge or facts or achievement, it's something that's freely given, we will begin to stride in wisdom. We will move in the direction of wisdom, and God's love will be the fuel, not not hot pockets, God's love will be the fuel that pushes us forward. So what does it mean for you and I this week to stride in wisdom? One, I think it means spending time getting to know the God who created you. Spending time reading his word daily, talking to him through prayer. I mean, think about it. If you spent time every day reading books on how to bake a cake every single day for the rest of your life, by the time you were 80, you would probably know everything there is to know about cakes. How to cook them properly, how to get the batter just right for the perfect taste. By the way, if you're one of those people, I would love to volunteer myself to taste test all your cakes. But but what would happen if you started reading God's word every single day? Like, how would you grow in wisdom? How would that guide you as you're confronting the gray areas of life? And how would that affect your decision making? Second, I think striding in wisdom means spending time with people who are wiser than you. In many cases, this is someone who's older than you, who has been in your shoes as a teen, a young adult, a parent, a grandparent. We love to say here at church that it takes every generation to reach the next generation. It's something we believe at our core. And honestly, we have so much we can learn and glean from those who have gone before us. I would encourage you this week to sit down with someone over a Zoom call or a phone call and glean wisdom. Hear their story. Let it grow you and shape you and and learn how they navigated gray areas of life in depending on God. See, to stride in wisdom, we have to take daily steps in the right direction, fueled by God's love. 
Quick fixes, knowledge, and facts are great things that can help you in certain areas of life, but they aren't enough to sustain you through the gray areas of life. The questions with multiple right answers. To navigate the complexities that life has to offer, we must stride in wisdom. I mean, picture how your life would change as you begin to strive in wisdom. How, how would you navigate job changes and, and turbulent family dynamics, disappointment, loss, anxiety? How would your striding in wisdom impact your kids and your neighbors and your workplace? By not settling for quick, easy fixes, but instead striding to walk in wisdom, how would that impact this community here? How would it impact the next generation of Jesus followers? May we be a people that stride in wisdom, fueled by the love of our Heavenly Father through the complexities and gray areas of life. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing in this place. I pray, God, that you would cultivate wisdom in our lives that we wouldn't look to the things of this world to in, inform us on, on how to make decisions, especially in the gray areas of life, but we would first look to you. Would you lead us and guide us in everything we say and everything we do? In your name, amen.